My name is Siani Sumulayamis. Just by saying my name, everyone in this crowd has been confronted with the basis of my identity and the basis of my story. My story starts like many stories have started. Some people believe their stories have started with birth tales or called to them by their parents, as well as horror stories from when they were first embarrassed. And then you have the occasional birthday, wedding, or funeral. My mother would say that my story first begun when she gave birth to me. The hours of her and Lee were increasing and decreasing based on how angry, proud, happy, or mad at me she is at that specific time and moment. When I'm hungry and my sweet tooth is acting up, I would say that my story first begun when I tasted caramel cookie crunch ice cream. I can still remember journeying with my mother to a hair cedar in the dead of night and hearing the crinkling sounds of a plastic bag as it was filled with my Talenti can. When I'm in the classroom and I pick up a pen, my story begins the moment that I decided to write the stories that needed and deserved to be told. Our stories are constantly shifting and changing and growing with time, age, and experience, which is why we assign the definition of plural to our story beginnings instead of singular. I am no different than the masses. However, I believe the most important beginning of my story to begun, I was first confronted with the bonds and restrictions that representation placed on my story. Whenever I open up my phone and unlock the screen, I see a familiar app and I'm reminded that my story first begun through TikTok. A lot of us know TikTok. Some of us hate it, some of us revere it, and others detest it. Fortunately for me, I belong in all three of those categories. Before the pandemic, before quarantining, I detested the dancing app. I ridiculed all of my friends who joined it. I never knew that I would one day find my story on TikTok. I like to think that the pandemic forced me to join TikTok. As the constant hours of repetitive nothingness dragged on and on, I was forced to relinquish whatever this taste I had for the dancing app, enjoying the masses and to singing these trendy songs and dancing to these quickly choreographed moves. However, when I stepped foot in this world of TikTok, I was suddenly enshrined in a new world full of colorful people that made all of the faces in my small North Carolinian town fade away into a realm of normalcy and simplicity. This new world of TikTok was big and strange, and I loved it. I suddenly found all that I had hoped for and never knew that I had hoped for. On TikTok, I found colorful, beautiful, plus-size women who encouraged me to love my body through self-love and self-confidence. I saw other teenagers who were just as invested in complex plots and multifaceted characters. In TikTok, I gained my sense of humor through various pop culture media references. In TikTok, I found all that I desired and never knew I desired, which is why I was so crushed when TikTok confirmed one of my deepest, darkest fears. Countless trends sprouted up from a social media app during the pandemic. But one of the most memorable and remarkable ones for me was the main character quizzes. There is nothing particularly groundbreaking about these main character quizzes. They were simply videos where a creator asked their viewers whether or not they would be the main character, the antagonist, the love interest, the side character, or the villain through a series of questions. They were simply a ploy by creators desperate for views to target generations using narcissism. However, what was truly special about these main character quizzes was that somehow in the darkness of my room, I was personally targeted. And whenever I took these main character quizzes, I thirsted for my results. I dived onto my phone like a heathen, eager and desperate to see what I would find. However, what I found truly petrified me. I was not the main character. 
My story had not even truly yet begun was deemed not important enough to emphasize or even be told. Sure, the comments reassured me that the side character was just as important as the titular main character, but I thirsted for more. I desired for more. And I know some of the more pessimistic people in this audience are probably thinking that this is a simple TikTok quiz. And that this simple TikTok quiz was made by simple people who like to make simple TikTok quizzes. And that I am simple for wanting to be the main character. However, I was the eyes on Amon's growing up in this pandemic. And I was a black woman growing up on TikTok. And to understand the true implications of what it means to be a main character in America, one has to be presented with what a main character in America looks like. And that main character does not look like me. And no matter how much people disagree or say they disagree, everyone desires to be the main character. Being the main character contains so many implicit perks and conditions. Being the main character means that no matter what obstacles you go through, someone is watching, someone is rooting for your victory, and someone knows that you will succeed. And I don't know when I had this desire to become the main character or when it particularly started, but I think it started when I was young and earnest, and I believe it started when I was in front of a television screen that glimmered and gleamed under the night's glare. Before TikTok and before all the countless forms of media, the entertainment industry created to place shackles on our attention spans, there were two main essential powerful forces that controlled late millennials and generations years. And those powerful forces were Disney Channel and Nickelodeon. No one, not even my mother, could compare to the hold that Disney Channel placed on me. I lived and breathed on Disney Channel. I thrived on the channel and their main characters. Their shows were my lives. Everyone who witnessed Disney's control in 2001 to 2007 characters most likely saw we took several of our characteristics from the main characters presented on the shows. They most likely saw how we erected foundational morals and values of respect, kindness, and perseverance when seeing these main characters enrich their friendship bonds and sibling bonds and overcome obstacle after obstacle. To understand the bond between us and these main characters is to understand the bond between people and their stories. I wanted so badly to be like all the main characters that dusted my screen because they reaffirmed all the positive values and morals that my grandmother and mother had instilled in me from such a young age. Yet none of them happened to look like me. And that's not to say that there weren't black women on screen. There was Ivy, Teddy's plus size best friend, who was funny and sassy and often whenever she appeared on screen, laughter erupted from an invisible audience. However, I didn't want to be Ivy. I didn't want to be laughed at. And I didn't want to be just there. And I didn't want to be what someone described as simply funny and sweet and sassy. And I did not want to be the comedic movie because I was multifaceted, multi-layered and detailed. And I felt as if I deserved to see myself as a main character. I deserved to see myself as a screen and know that I serve some purpose beyond being just funny. I crave that deeply and subconsciously. And I know people often want to mention Ant Farm and Casey Undercover as possible rebuttals to say that there were more black women on screen. But when you are mentioning a couple four leaf clovers amongst billions of three leaf clovers, one cannot help but doubt the existence of four leaf clovers. And as I stared at the screen and thought back to the main black woman I had seen on screen, I thought of the funny, goofy, lovable black woman. And then I thought of the spiteful, angry black woman. And then there was the sex crazed, lustful black woman. And as I weighed these characterizations and stereotypes in my hand, I realized that this wasn't the first time that I thought of them. This certainly wouldn't be the last for many people before and after me. And I decided to coin all of these women with the term of the wholly acceptable trinity of all black women, because it honestly felt sacrilegious to use any other word but holy. 
Somewhere there was an unwritten rule that dictated that black women would have to shift and contort our bodies into strange shapes and sizes in order to fit one of these three categories. We had to be one of them. This was our purpose and this was our life. I had to choose one of them because these were the holy trinity of all black women. I had to choose and pick before someone else picked what category of black women I belonged into. So as I weighed all of the choices and hands, I thought to myself, and I thought what other people had seen in me. I wasn't angry or aggressive unless my mother or grandmother would allow me to have extra servings of ice cream so that weight visibly hit the floor with a loud claim. I wasn't a Jezebel because I was only 10, so that weight hit the floor with a bang. I was left with only one lonely weight. I chose this. I chose to be a black woman that is only seen as funny and goofy and laughable. I chose to be the stereotype. Because what else could I be than being the main character? I don't want to even mention the love interest wasn't an option. Suddenly, all of my characteristics molded into one slate frame of boring gray. Suddenly, everything that once made me happy, everything that once made me mean, had made up my story, disappeared. And I was left with only this. I had to be funny. I had to be the one where laughter erupted from the room because I couldn't be the one that was laughing. I had to serve as a comedic relief in friend groups. This was my purpose. This was, again, what I had chosen. I am sad to say that this is what I had thought myself to be. And I'm even more sad to say that there are other people who belong in minority and marginalized groups who have changed and shifted their bodies into deranged ways in order to fit into these tight definitions of what the media thinks they ought to be. But I had not wanted this for myself. I hadn't wanted to be what society dictated that I ought to be due to my outward appearance. I wanted to be different because, again, I was multifaceted and multi-layered and detailed once. I wanted to see myself as the main character once, and I had craved that deeply and subconsciously. I had craved to be different from the example set out before me. Representation matters. Being the love interest matters. Being chosen matters. Being decided upon matters. As members of the next generation, we are the next doctors, engineers, teachers, mathematicians, lunch workers, chefs, professors, lawyers, bus drivers, construction workers. Let us also be the next engineers and architects of a new future. Let that Asian child be able to see themselves on screen and decide not to pick the examples laid out before them and decide to create their own future. Let that Hispanic child think that today is the day that I will achieve my dreams instead of today is the day that I will crush my dreams. Let that queer person be kissed and loved and taken to prom. Let that disabled person be a person instead of disabled. Because again, representation matters. And as members of this new future and the next engineers and architects, let us also be the designers of a world where representation is erected on every television screen after us. Thank you.